various gospels okay we've got 36 references to miracles altogether and I'm going to ref I'm going to give you those miracles we have the feeding of the 5000 as mentioned in Mark chapter 6 35 Matthew 14 15 Luke 9 12 John 9 uh, John 6 5 we'll come to this one later on and uh, then we have walking on water we have that in Mark chapter 6 48 Matthew 14 25 and John 6 19 we have Peter's mother-in-law a healing in Mark 1 3, chapter 130 Matthew chapter 8 14 Luke chapter 4 38 we have a man with leprosy and healing uh, Mark chapter 1 verse 40 uh, Matthew chapter 8 24 or, um, and Luke chapter 12 we have uh, the paralyzed man and Mark chapter 2 3 Matthew chapter 9 2 Luke chapter 5 18 we have the man with the shriveled hand we have that in Mark chapter 3 verse 1 Matthew chapter 12 10 and Luke chapter 6 verse 6 we have the calming of the storm in Mark chapter 4 verse 37 Matthew chapter 8 23 and Luke chapter 8 22 we have the gathering demoniac uh, or exorcism in Mark chapter 5 verse 1 Matthew chapter 8 verse 28 Luke chapter 8 verse 22 27 we have the raising of Jairus daughter Mark chapter 5 22 Matthew chapter 9 18 Luke um, 8 41 we have the hemorrhaging of the woman and her healing Mark chapter 5 25 Matthew 9 20 Luke uh, 8 43 we have the demon possessed boy uh, exercise uh, exorcism in Mark chapter 9 17 Matthew chapter 17 14 Luke chapter 9 38 we have the healing of the two blind men in Mark chapter 10 verse 46 Matthew chapter 20 verse 29 Luke chapter 18:35. then we have the Canaanite woman's daughter uh, exorcism in Mark chapter 7 verse 24 Mark chapter 15 21 we have the feeding of the 4,000 Mark chapter 8 verse 1 Matthew, Matthew uh, uh, chapter 15 32 we have the fig tree with it Mark chapter 11 12 Matthew 21 18 we have uh, 16 possessed men a possessed man in the synagogue in Mark chapter 124 and Luke chapter 433 we have a Roman centurion servant healing in Luke Matthew chapter 8 verse 5 Luke chapter 7 verse 1 we have uh, the blind mute possessed man in the exorcism in uh, Mark uh, Matthew chapter 12 22 Luke chapter 11 14 we have the healing of the deaf mute in Mark chapter 7 31 we have the healing of the blind man of Bethesda in chapter uh, Mark chapter 8 verse 22 we have uh, two blind men healed in Matthew chapter 9 27 mute and possessed man he healed uh, exercise, exorcism in Matthew 9:32. We have a coin in the fish mouth, um, Matthew chapter 17:24. We have uh, first catch of fish in Mark chapter, uh, sorry, in um, Luke chapter 5 verse 1. We have the raising of the widow's son at name uh, in Luke chapter 7 verse 11. And the prior one to that was Luke chapter 5 as one we have the exorcism of Mary Magdalene uh, Luke chapter 8 2 we have the crippled woman Luke chapter 13 11 we have the man with leprosy Luke chapter 14 1 
We had ten men with ten men with leprosy healed. Um, Luke chapter seventeen eleven, the high priest's servant the healing. Uh, Luke twenty two fifty. We have the white miracle at Cana in John chapter two verse one. We have the official son at Capernaum healed. Uh, John four forty six. We have the sick man at Pool of Bethesda. Uh, John 5 1 we have the healing of the blind man John 9 1 we have the raising of Lazarus John 11 1 and the second catch of fish John 21 1 okay uh, the list of all what that get we have uh, breaking it down 17 healing events which are in all four Gospels seven exorcisms except in John all the other Gospels but John three pre three three pre cognitions except in the Gospel of Mark three revivication miracles in all four Gospels six nature miracles in all four Gospels uh, creation of matter defiance of gravity control of thermal energy ie calming of the storm defiance of gravity walking on water uh, control of metabolic process withering of fig tree rearrangement of molecular structure creation of matter turning water into wine um, if you want to look at the list, if you go to uh, Christian Think Tank, uh, did the New Testament authors invent the miracle stories in the Gospels? And you can get the breakdown of the miracles there. And I quoted exactly from Christian Think Tank. He allows you to use his material. But I quoted uh, the breakdown of 17 healings, 7 exorcisms is all from what he says there. Now these are my own thoughts as I look at this list. Um, let's just type in here. Okay, I'm trying to find uh, Okay, we'll 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 um Just a bit of background here. Um, this is uh, Jack, uh, the history of thinking about miracles in the West. Jacob Paul Kowalski, uh, 
Polikowski. Um, Phil, he writes we, uh, about the Roman Greek Roman culture. We we find evidence of events considered to be miracles, including miraculous healing, already in the ancient writings, according to the ancient Greeks and gods. Heroes, people elevated divinity due to their exceptional merit, and a few exceptional people were able to perform miracles. He write, in his footnote he writes, only people who had special characteristics were said to be able to cause miracles. For example, they could have exceptional knowledge of nature, such as Pythagoras uh, and Modicles led the life of a saint, such as Apollonius of Titian, be anointed or be an incarnation of a god. This tradition had its roots in the time of Pharaoh's revived in the Roman Empire and some modern monarchies. Um, I'll come back to that in a minute. The Greeks maintained that the world had not been created but had emerged from chaos or was simply eternal. The gods were believed to be just part of the world even if they did not have absolute power over natural phenomena. They had enough power to be considered by humans as causing miracles. Each god or hero had his or own specific domain of activity. Miraculous healings were ascribed almost exclusively to Asclepius, Heracles, or Isis. The most worshipped among them was Asclepius um, in ancient Greece, his temple. There were about 300 of these were the destination of pilgrimage and the site of numerous healings in Epidaurus in Peloponnese. Many scriptures and votive offerings expressing gratitude for being healed were found. In addition, some philosophers such as Pi Thagoras and Empodocles um, were believed to be thaumaturgic uh, Thoma as well, although they themselves denied performing miracles and claimed that they simply knew nature. Belief in miracles persisted in the days of the Roman Empire. In the first century BC, one of the most famous um, flourished Apollonius of Tyana who was believed to heal sick people to walk on water to bilicate, to levitate and to raise people from the dead Severtonius and Tacitus reported that Vespian Caesar had healed two sick people one of them being blind the other crippled in Alexandria the temples of um, Asclepius the Roman spelling of Asclepius were very popular at the time the most famous among them being that in Pergamon. The method of cure, uh, methods of curing used in places became more rational, healing baths and strolls rather than sacred sleep. This rationalization of this treatment process probably contributed to the fact that the temple record at the time no longer mentioned any acts of sudden healing. On the other hand, the records have revealed many acts of gratitude for health improvements. The development of philosophy and science caused the differentiation of attitudes towards the perception of God's nature in humans and the emergence of some, some skeptical views in miracles. Cicero, 1st century BC, maintained that miracle stories were only useful for the piety of ignorant folk. Celsus, after Epicurus, claimed that the gods were not interested in human affairs. He undermined the credibility of Christian miracles by arguing that we could fail to recognize somebody's death. I believe the awakening has a miraculous character, as in the case of Asclepiades. Uh, Ask this physician who lived in the first century was credited with raising a girl from the dead, but he himself believed that he had simply recognized the signs of life. Sextus and Pericus, third century AD, a representative member of the skeptics, doubted the truth of the stories about Asclepiades. Uh, called Pius and his miraculous healings because those stories appeared to differ substantially depending on the teller's imagination. Um, he talks about Apollonius and the writing of Apollonius comes after Christianity and some scholars such as Lycona have said that 
there was kind of a uh, myth making going on there because it was kind of trying to give uh, a response to Christianity. So that's whether there's much historical information there, but this writer seems to think that the information about Apollonius goes back to prior to the first century to uh, to uh, prior, prior to Jesus Christ, but that I beg to differ on that. So what do we learn from from that? Well, we learn that in the ancient world there was um, claims of healing in the first century, um, that there were temple healings going on. Um, so that's just part of the the culture of that first century. So good place to go. Fordham University. So what we're doing here, we're, we're just we're just basically just trying to be open-minded, uh, and basically just trying to be open-minded and, and just look at uh, Okay, so one of my favorite places. Right, so let's just look at uh, a couple. Let's just look, just just being open-minded. Let's just read Mark chapter six thirty-five. Okay. So the whole exercise of this is just to be open-minded. Uh, Mark chapter six thirty-five. Late the afternoon, the disciples came to him and said, "This desolate place, and it is getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy themselves some food." But Jesus said, "You feed them with what they asked. It would take a small fortune to buy food." For all this crowd, how much food do you have? He asked. Go and find out. They came back and reported, We have five loads of bread and two fishes. Then Jesus told the crowd to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat in the groups of fifty or a hundred. Then Jesus took the five loaves and two fishes, looked up towards heaven and asked God's blessing on the food, breaking the loaves into pieces. He kept giving the bread and fish to the disciples to give to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and they picked up the twelve baskets of leftovers with the, of the bread. Five thousand men had eaten the five loaves. Now, I think reading that, one thing, a couple of things that impressed me with that: the the plain and simplicity of the writing, the lack of wanting to draw attention to itself, the lack of flamboyant writing, the lack of hero worship it's just very plain matter of fact very simple kind of writing style let's turn to Luke 14 15 Luke 14 then I want to break down in my own way uh, some thoughts uh, 14 15 Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, "What? It would have to show. 
or sorry, uh, Luke four. Uh, sorry, Matthew fourteen. Sorry, Matthew fourteen, fifteen. Matthew. So we're not we're not concerned about can miracles happen or not. What we're concerned about is just thinking about the text, breaking down the list of miracles, thinking about the relation, how they relate to each other, and how they flow in reading them. That's all we're doing. We're not entering into a philosophical discussion about miracles. We're we're just thinking about miracles in the historical context and the textual basis of miracles. Matthew fourteen fifteen. That's what we're looking at. The evening the disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place and it is getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy food. But Jesus replied, That isn't necessary. You feed them. Impossible, they explained. We have only five loaves of bread and two fishes. Bring them here, he said. Then he told the people to sit down on the grass and he took the five loaves and two fishes, looked up towards heaven and asked God's blessing on the food, breaking the loaves into pieces. He gave some of the bread and fish to eat disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate as much as they wanted, and they picked up the twelve baskets of leftovers. About five thousand men eating from the loaves, in addition to all the women and children. And then Luke nine twelve. Late in the afternoon, the twelve disciples came to him and said, Send the crowds away. Jesus said, You feed them. Impossible, they protested. We have only five loaves of bread and two fishes. Or are you expecting us to go and buy enough food for this whole crowd? For there were about 5,000 men there, etc. Um, reading that, if I'm intellectually honest, to me, and I'm being intellectually honest, if it sounded not true I would not believe it but if I'm intellectually honest to me that sounds like an authentic narrative it, it's obvious that each of the writers this miracle impacted them and they've remembered it and that's what comes across as you read it in a fair honest way there's no embellishment it's just plain and simple and I think you have to be impressed with that I am it strikes me if I was reading something that was full of vombosity, um, full of um, long windedness, or there was some kind of false motive going on, then I would just not believe it. But it's not doing that in the text. It's just coming across as very plain, very simple, almost un unassuming, but obviously pointing to something that really affected the disciples. Um, now let's just break this down right I'm going to go through each one uh, just thinking about it now you've got four references to the feeding of the 5,000 if you're doing historical verification if you've got three historical references that's good so you got four references you got three references to the walking on water you got three references to Man in leprosy, three of the paralyzed man, three of the shriveled hand, three of the calm in storm, three of the gathering demoniac, three of Jairus' daughter, three of the hemorrhaging of the woman, uh, three of the two women in the blood. And then you have Mark and Matthew uh, verifying uh, the feeding of the 4,000, the fig tree. Um, you have uh, Mark and Luke verifying um, the possessed man in the synagogue healing. Um, you have Mark, Matthew and Luke verifying uh, the Roman centurion's servant, the blind mute. 
Uh, you have Mark on the deaf mute. Uh, you have the blind man at Bethesda in Mark 8.22. You have Matthew verifying two blind men, mute and possessed man. A coin in the fish mouth, so that's 9.27, And you have Luke verified in the fishing catch of the fish, raising widow's son. Exorcism, exorcism of Mary, crippled woman, meant with dropsy, two men with leprosy, high priest servant. And wine miracles at Canaan, miracle son at Capernaum, sick man at pool. All in the Gospel of John. Now, what I find interesting, what comes to light when I look at the list of the miracles, you find a massive block <coughs> of three lots Matthew, Mark, and Luke, <coughs> all verified miracles. You find two miracles verified. <coughs> sorry, uh, one miracle verified by all four, and one miracle verified by all three except Luke. And then uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, forty miracles verified in uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And then you have material verified in Mark and Matthew, Mark and Luke, Matthew and Luke, uh, then material verified in Mark, Matthew and Luke and John. What it's all telling you is very, very clear. It's giving you a solid historical representation of what happened in Jesus' life concerning the miracles. It's giving you a very fair synopsis and a very balanced portrayal of the miracle. That's how it seems to me when you look at a chart and you look at where the distribution of the miracles have occurred in the text. That's what comes across. So to me either what's quite remarkable there is either these guys were geniuses, historical geniuses or something because what what's happened is you get in three of the main gospels verifying about a quarter of all the miracles and then each of the gospels doing combinations of say Matthew Mark Mark Luke Matthew Luke combining and then having individual material. In other words, the writers have given a multiplicity of verification of the miracles. You've got multiple attestation in, you've got at least 12 of the miracles verified by at least three authors. So that's good historical information that we know that that's happened then. But on top of that, the rest of the miracles are distributed evenly in different combinations of the Gospels, showing you that they are independent historical material as well. A lot of people think that Mark, Luke and Matthew copied from Mark, but because there's a distribution of other of the miracles verified by a combination of Matthew, Mark, Luke and Mark, it kind of shows that each gospel was independent of each of the gospels uh, working on other sources that so, some of the other gospels didn't use. That's what I get of looking at the distribution chart of the gospels. I mean, you, you might uh, disagree. I know this is a bit long-winded long and you're probably bored of it, but um, I think that um, I think what we'll do is uh, I'm a bit tired. Sorry about this. We'll bring in uh, Keena on miracles.
really, really getting a bit tired now. So we'll, we'll, we'll end it now with a bit of Kina on, on my course. We'd like to thank author and scholar Craig Keener today for joining us here at CBD for an interview about his new book, um, a two-volume work called Miracles, in which he addresses the phenomena of miracles in the New Testament and also as as they have been um, documented in the modern world. For our first question today, um, Craig, this book um, kind of came about in, in, in a unique way. I was wondering if you could go into some of the details regarding the book's origins um, and, and how the project came into being. Sure. The book actually originated as a footnote in my Acts commentary, which ironically is coming out after this book. But I was dealing with questions of historical reliability uh, of the Book of Acts. And uh, had, had earlier, uh, well, actually, I wrote uh, Historical Jesus of the Gospels after I finished my Acts commentary, too. But that came out even earlier. Um, but I didn't deal with miracles much in that book. I said, OK, I'm going to refer it to, um, to a sequel. But originally, it was just a footnote in my Acts commentary. I wanted to say, well, the people who say that eyewitnesses would never say anything like this, that all this stuff has to be either made up or legendary accretion, there are eyewitnesses in the world who claim these things today. And so we ought to we ought to take that into account, not just assume that these things would be made up. And I was going to just cite um, you know, two or three sources in my footnote because I, I knew that there were these uh, accounts all around, I'd heard a number of them, and I knew that there were some books that mentioned some of them, but I wanted to find like one or two books that cataloged a fairly large number of them. And initially, I didn't find those. Uh, I was expecting to find them. And so I started just doing research and collecting more of the data. Uh, eventually, I did find some books that cataloged some, some miracles in different ways, but the footnote grew and grew. And after about 100 pages, it was a chapter by that point, um, I asked the publisher if uh, maybe we could just consider breaking it out into a separate book. And of course, it's grown to nearly 1,200 pages since that time. And I mean, more information keeps coming in, but anyway, the book is out now. So in the book, one of your, um, one of your primary goals is, um, I guess, um, a philosophical agenda. Um, David Hume is is he rejected miracles because they're not universally verifiable by human experience. Um, yeah. Now, why? Um, and that's kind of in, in some ways has been kind of a running methodology for modern scholarship for for a really long time. Uh, with some exceptions, C.S. Lewis obviously took a, exception to that line of reasoning. Um, but why? From your perspective, um, does that line of reasoning fail to adequately deal with um, historiographical questions when it comes to miracles? Yeah, thank you. The, the book actually addresses two, two levels of the question. I mean, one is do eyewitnesses have experiences like this or claim experiences like this, like the ones we have in the Gospels and Acts? And I think when you look at the evidence, there's no way to deny that they do. So we don't need to say that those things were, were made up later on uh, mm -hmm. after you know people forgot what, what went on originally. That, that's the, the primary thesis of the book. But the secondary thesis of the book is the one that is more controversial in the sense that I, I'm arguing that we don't need to once, once we note these experiences, we don't need to a priori dismiss them as actual miracles. 
Um, what scholars sometimes do is, is a, a neutral approach, saying let's just describe the experiences and not talk about whether they're actually divine or supernatural acts or not. And, and that's, that's a legitimate approach. I mean, you're just saying, okay, this is what we're going to look at. We're not going to ask the other questions. But, but the idea that one has to screen it out so that one can't believe that these are divine acts, uh, as you said, that's based on the legacy of David Hume and his philosophy. Actually, it wasn't just Hume. Uh, it was an argument that circulated among the deists, and Hume kind of uh, abbreviated, he condensed uh, some common deist arguments of his era. Uh, some of the uh, debates about what Hume meant are because his, his essay is so short on the subject, um, but it, when you read it in the context of the deists, then it, a lot of the points make more sense. Mm -hmm. But um, Hume's argument is, uh, well, actually, it's a long argument. Uh, short essay, but I mean, it's a longer argument than I'm going to summarize here, but just part of the heart of his argument is that from universal, uh, uniform human experience, we don't believe, we don't have any reason to believe miracle reports, because uniform human experience is against that, and uh, what we can extrapolate based on natural law is from this uniform human experience. The problem with Hume's argument, he got away with it in his day, although some people did try to call him on it. Uh, his argument is circular mm -hmm. because he assumes human experience to be uniform and uses that to exclude miracle claims that actually show that human experience might not be uniform. He, he does it even with some uh, in his own day, well, earlier than his own day, um, Pascal's niece, Louis Pascal's niece, was uh, healed of a, an organic running eyesore. It stank. Everybody knew about it around her. She was instantly and publicly healed of this. There were many witnesses, the Queen Mother of France and her own physician to verify it. Hume cites this and then says, Okay, well, this is better attested than any miracle we have in the New Testament. But since we know that miracles don't happen, this really didn't happen. And therefore, uh, it just shows you that even when you have good witnesses, miracles don't happen. Well, right. It's an entirely circular argument. Right. So miracles don't happen because they can't happen. Right. Yeah. And they can't happen because they don't happen. Right. A little bit tired, but uh, just uh, the book is really addressing two different kinds of questions. The first question is a historical question, because some scholars say that well, all these accounts of miracles and gospels and acts must have arisen through legendary accretion, because they say we know that eyewitnesses never claim. Miracles. <clears throat> that question is very easily answered because hundreds of millions of eyewitnesses do claim miracles. We have overwhelming evidence for that. So if anyone denies that, their head is in the sand. The other question is a bit more complicated because it involves whether or not such acts, when they happen, are acts of God. Now, I believe that they're acts of God. I'm a Christian. But in my earlier days, when I was an atheist, that would have been a very surprising notion to me. So people come with different presuppositions. And because of that, uh, part of the book is just addressing whether uh, these uh, surprising healings and so on are acts of God. And I argue in the book that we have considerable evidence for such acts. As a New Testament scholar, I'm, I and other New Testament scholars are usually concerned with studying people who are dead. 
Um, in this case, however, I wanted to bring in evidence from people who were alive. And the reason for that is that when we make an argument from analogy historically, we want to make it with, with um, events and experiences that are around today, experiences that we can test. So uh, when people say, well, uh, nobody in antiquity could have experienced miracles because nobody does today, that's, uh, that's on the assumption that it doesn't happen today. But a Pew Forum survey several years ago found something like in, in Pentecostal and charismatic circles alone, roughly 200 million people in 10 countries alone who claimed to have witnessed or experienced divine healing. What was more dramatic was that among other Christians who didn't claim to be Pentecostal or charismatic, they found that roughly one-third of those claimed to have witnessed or experienced divine healing. This is, uh, this is an experience that is widespread in many parts of the world. All right. Well, let me introduce a good friend of mine, Protestant Catholics. What may be more surprising to most people today is that among the other Christians in those 10 countries alone, around 39% claim to have witnessed divine healing. Just get it on the... See that it doesn't flash on, on that. It seems to be flashing. All right. Uh, and, and over in that corner, the, the very lovely one is my wife. Many church fathers claim to be eyewitnesses of healings and exorcisms that were converting many polytheists. In fact, Ramsey McMullen, and he seemed reluctant about this in an interview I heard, but, but he documents that in the third and fourth centuries, the leading cause of conversion to Christianity was healings and exorcisms. And it, it continued through the, through the later church. Uh, there are a number of stories we could tell from Augustine. Augustine originally believed these things had died out for the most part. But he retracted that later on in his writings, City of God 22.8. He gives a, a, a list of miracles that had happened in his own diocese, uh, some things that he had witnessed or experienced. I talked about uh, within the diocese healings of blindness, raisings from the dead, and so on, that they had collected over 70 affidavits of different uh, healing claims, and he knew of other people who hadn't turned in the data. I'm going to just concentrate on certain kinds of healing claims for the sake of time. But we have a, a large number of reports of healings of blindness. And I don't want you to get the wrong idea. We have far more people who haven't been healed of it than who have been healed of it. But uh, that's, that's a different kind of subject. We're talking about, about miracles. So um, one of the accounts I have, uh, one, of my, one of my students at a Baptist seminary where I taught, before I taught at Asbury, was uh, Paul Mukaki who did his master's degree there and then his, his DMIN. And he had a number of reports for me, but um, he had gone back to, back to Cameroon. And one of our other students, Yolanda McCain, who was from Philadelphia, went to visit Cameroon. And she was there when Paul prayed for someone who was blind and they were able to see. And so she came back and she was telling us about it. So I asked Paul and he said, oh, yeah. Mm. But he had so many stories. There are a number of cases where eyes white from cataracts. We have eyewitnesses who saw them instantly healed. We, we also have um, some publicly documented, uh, publicly acknowledged, medically documented cases where eye scarring disappeared. This is Dr. Kato. He's the president of Shalom University in uh, Bunya, the DRC, uh, Congo DRC. And we were doing some work on ethnic reconciliation together. So I asked him uh, one day, since I was working on the Miracles book, by the way, do you have any miracle stories? He said, well, yeah, years ago, when we were out doing evangelism in a village, a few of us, 
they brought to us a woman who was, was, who was blind. And so we were asked to pray for her. And we'd never done that before. But we said, well, we came that God's name might be glorified. So let's just pray and see what God might do. And they started praying. And after about two minutes, this woman who was, we think, in her 60s, she's, she started shouting, I can see, I can see, and began dancing around. Um, and she remained sighted for the rest of her life. A friend of mine, Flint McLaughlin, who was director of the Cambridge Business Institute, he was uh, in India with some other people. I consulted uh, one of them as well. And he prayed for a blind man with clouded eyes. And the man was instantly healed. This is the field where he ran in circles praising God. And here is where the man began to weep as he was coming to give his testimony that night. And someone asked him, why are you weeping? He said, I've always heard the voices of the children, but I've never seen them before. I want to give some accounts of raisings from the dead. Because normally people don't consider people to be psychosomatically dead. <clears throat> so I'm just going to give a few samples. So some of these in the Church Fathers, uh, Wesley in his journal, now, this is not something that was recorded a long time later. This was recorded at the time of the events. He prayed for somebody, Mr. Myrick, that he believed was dead, and the man came back. Uh, we, have, we have scores of these testimonies. Obviously, again, most people who die stay dead, but this is just saying we, we do have some exceptions. A pastor in Mumbai shared with me this, and this isn't one of the strongest cases, but since I'm using PowerPoint, I'm using the ones where I have pictures. So... Believers found a Hindu boy, Vikram, lying at the bottom of a pool at a retreat center where they were visiting. And so two of them took him to a hospital where they pronounced him dead. They took him to another hospital where they also pronounced him dead. But an hour and a half later, they came back. Uh, while the believers were all praying, they came back with the boy alive. And these pictures are from him after they brought him back alive. He said that he heard the name Jesus and then was rescued. His Hindu parents said, he's never heard that name before. And this is a picture of them joining in the worship service of the Christians afterwards. This is a testimony. It's not featured very much in the Miracles book because I met the person afterwards. Uh, this is uh, Yusuf Herman. And I have this picture because he's the one who put me in touch with this other person. Uh, he knows the person very well. But I put this picture first to remind me to warn you that if you get queasy at the sight of blood, you need to close your eyes uh, until further notice, or at least until uh, you can tell I've moved on to another topic and forgot to tell you. This is uh, a person you can see he was dead. His, his neck was cut. Um, actually, they'd moved his body. There was more blood in the field where he was. But they they cut his throat. The way they were transporting him to the hospital obviously was not very good for a body that would be alive either. These were pictures from the news. Uh, I have the, the news report and I uh, took, took these out of the news report. Uh, in this case it required medical intervention, but he had, a, he had an, an NDE. <laughs> he had an experience of heaven and then um, um, when they were getting ready to pronounce him dead and send him to the morgue, he said, I'm still alive. <laughs> so they, they started working on sewing back his neck. Uh, I, was, I was giving some of these accounts, and so many, so many more of these, but for the sake of time, I was giving some of these accounts at a Society of Biblical Literature meeting where I was not trying to persuade people of the supernatural. I was simply saying, you know, our, our reading strategies, maybe we could learn something from the majority world where they don't, find these an embarrassment, but they can resonate more with these stories that we have in the New Testament, because look, we have stories like this today. And after I'd finished, um, Ayo Adewoya, who's a professor now in the U.S., but he's from Nigeria originally, he stood up in the back and he said, I have one of those stories. My son was stillborn, and the midwife and I prayed for 30 minutes, and my son came back to life. And his son has now finished a Master of Science degree at the University of London. Again, no brain damage in any of these cases, no brain damage. Another another account, uh, just because I was working the miracle.
This is key there again. Just wanted to kind of reflect on what this process has been like, the research and writing it for you. Um, how has writing this book affected you? In the case of the miracle accounts, at the beginning, sometimes I was I was asking people really hard questions because I was I was coming coming at them despite some experiences of mine in the past. I was coming at them with very skeptical questions, but after a while, it just wore down my skepticism because there there was just such an abundance of evidence, sometimes corroborating eyewitnesses, independent uh, eyewitnesses, and then when you had medical documentation, eventually. I stopped trying to be neutral and just said, this is what I believe. But what do you feel God taught you personally in, within your research? I think God broke down the wall inside of me that said, yeah, we can trust God for salvation. We can trust God for spiritual things. But these other things are off limits. We're not supposed to trust God for or visible miracles that can't be explained some other way. There's no limit to what God can do. We can trust Him. What do you think God is trying to communicate to us through these stories, to modern day Christians? What is He communicating through your work, and what does it say about Him? The Bible speaks of gifts of healings. It also speaks of anointing the sick in James chapter 5. Those are things that are for the church, they're, they're for our benefit, they're, they're blessings. But in the Gospels and Acts, it also speaks of signs and wonders. In, in terms of, of healing, God can heal us in a variety of ways. God can work for doctors and often does work for doctors. But signs and wonders are a kind of evidence that gets our attention. It doesn't persuade everyone, but this, this activity of God gets our attention and really challenges our assumptions. In the case of the kinds of signs and wonders like raising from the dead, instant healing of blind eyes, and, and so forth, those things challenge non-believers to recognize that God is real. The God who is the Father of Jesus Christ is real and alive. And in many places, people have, it, it's not just the kind of natural rivers that they see that God has built in nature anyway, because people see those in other cases, but in, in these cases, people are often willing to abandon centuries of, of other traditions to turn to faith in the God of Jesus Christ. But for us as Christians in the West, I think it's a reminder that God really is God, and that our faith can't be limited to just spiritual things. So that's uh, Keena there. And if you notice um, the two volume work, uh, it's a massive work. Okay, um, I'm going to put the picture back on. <coughs> tired today. I've been busy today. <coughs> I just got back from Sheffield today. Okay, uh, it's not been brilliant. Um, <coughs> have a look at, uh, <coughs> excuse me, Excuse me.
uh, in the Evangelical Dictionary of Theology by uh, uh, Walter Elwell, we read these words. It is sometimes claimed that the culture of the late 20th century is post-Christian. Those who put forward this claim point out that while the presuppositions and concepts of the historic Christian faith remain intelligible to modern man, they are no longer foundation to our worldview. They claim that man has now come of age, that we now have a scientific and empirical worldview that is obviously linked up with the reality and which cannot take miracles seriously. In fact, this perspective finds the biblical basis of miracles to be somewhat offensive. It is clear that Orthodox Christianity cannot accept this worldview with its suspicion of miracles. Belief in miracles lies at the heart of authentic Christian faith. Without the miracle of the first Easter, Christianity could no doubt could no doubt long since have passed from the scene and would certainly not be surrounded to offend the modern man. It should be clear, however, that this worldview is part of the cultural milieu of the which when Christians find themselves. Understanding the role of miracles in the genesis and spread of our faith is therefore an imperative for us today. So he goes on there. <laughs> Marshall Pickering Encyclopedia of the Bible. Let's see, we got miracles here. Yeah. Wow, it's a massive write up on miracles in here. We'll, we'll just read a little bit. Uh, volume 2, uh, Walter Ewell. Even on miracles, even which may seem contrary to nature and which signifies an act in which God reveals himself to man, the classical definition of a miracle assumes that it's contrary to natural law, but this is a misnomer for two reasons. First, many of the miracles of the Bible use nature right, rather than bypass it, e.g. the wind which parted the Red Sea, Exodus 14.21. Second, there no longer is a concept of absolute natural law, rather a phenomenon which is not readily explicable, e.g. quasars may reflect laws which science is not yet fully conversant. In scripture, the element of faith is crucial. A natural approach cannot prove or disprove the presence of miracles. The timing and content of the process can be miraculous, even though the event may seem natural. The consistent rationalistic demonstrates the necessity of faith. You should place any so-called miracle in the category of unexplained phenomena rather than accept it as a pointer to the presence of God's activity in the world. In every case, God performed the miracle not merely as a wonder to inspire all in man, but a sign to draw men to himself. Massive uh, article on miracles here. We, we've been reading the Gospels, um, so we'll read what he has to say about the Gospels. Uh, miracles in Mark. Mark, the first of the four Gospels is to be, to be written, has often been called the Action Gospel because of its emphasis on Jesus' deeds rather than his teaching. This is also true regarding Jesus' miracles, for Mark contains more proportionally than any of the others. R. A. Fuller, in his interpreting of the miracles, has noted five groups in Mark. The first centers on Jesus' authority over demons in Mark chapter 1, 21, 30. 39. The second comes Jesus' authority over the law and conflict with the opponents in Mark chapter 1 verse 40 to chapter 3 verse 6. They result in the fame, in fame but occasion, they result in fame but his occasion, his refusal to allow his true identity as son of God to be known. The third group, chapter 3 verse 7 to 30, contains exorcisms and the bleeds of controversy, uh, uh, centering on his power over Satan. The fourth group, chapter 4, 35, chapter 5, 43, contains especially powerful miracles, stilling the storm, 
the gathering demoniac, the raising of the Jairus' daughter, and probably center on the disciples as Jesus thereby reveals to them the meaning of the kingdom and seek to overcome their spiritual dullness. The fifth final group in chapter 6 verse 30 to chapter 8 verse 26 continues the theme of disciples' misunderstanding and prepares the way for the passion with the message regarding the bread, blindness and the judgment of God. The miracles in Mark center on conflict first with Jesus' opponents and then with his own disciples. While they are harbingers of God's kingdom, their purpose is to force encounter with Jesus' true significance. They do not show Jesus as an, an Hellenistic wonder worker. In fact, they lead only to amazement and then disbelief in those who do not have faith. Jesus' personhood has been hidden and can only be understood in the light of the cross. The miracles are not proofs but powers. God does not authenticate himself through them, but shows himself to those with the eyes to see. Miracles in Matthew. Miracles in Matthew. Matthew is the teaching gospel, and in his use of the miracles, dialogue takes place over action. Matthew compresses Mark's narrative in order to make room for didactic material. Therefore, his stress is on the theological implications of faith rather than the results they contain. Matthew's group of miracles are isometric to teaching passages in keeping with the general, his general practice of combining narrative portions and organizing them around didactic sections. The first group, chapter 8 and 9, combine miracles from Mark's first, second and fourth group and stress Jesus' significance as the servant of Yahweh who exercises sovereign power and forgiveness of sins. The secondary theme teaches discipleship and shows the awakening faith of the disciples and their involvement in Jesus' ministry. The second group, chapters 12, centers on his authority over the law, the man with the withered hand over Satan, the breeze of controversy. The third group, chapter 14 and 15, parallels the fifth group but has different purpose. Rather than conflict and decision, the disciples are seen in positive guys actively involved in the master's work. So the disciples become the, the means by which Jesus' ministry is continued. This is seen especially in Matthew's walking on the water scene in Mark cha uh, Matthew chapter 14, 22-33, in which Peter's faith is tested, not in Mark. In conclusion, Matthew has continued Mark's emphasis on miracles as establishing Jesus' authority and the inauguration of the kingdom age, but has clarified and expanded in the two directions, that of faith and discipleship, faith in Matthew is the means of appropriating the power of Jesus. Matthew chapter 8, 13, Matthew chapter 9, 22, and Matthew chapter 15, 28. Miracles in Luke. Luke acts is remarkable and extremely important because it establishes beyond dispute the early church belief that it was the absolute continuity with Jesus and that was continuing the work of God in the world. Luke's major stress is on salvation history and so one of his major stylistic methods for showing this direct connection is miraculous deeds. Especially enlightening here is Acts chapter 9 32 42 where in two healing miracles Peter duplicated the Lord's miracle the paralytic A-N-E-A-S -A Luke chapter 5, 18 to 26, the raising of Dorcas, Luke chapter 8, 49 and 56. From this respect, also, Luke returns to Mark's interest in the de deed more than the teaching. However, Luke goes even further than Mark for the miracle, val validated Jesus directly. The first group follows the inaugural address in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 to 24, which itself presents the miraculous deeds as authentic, authenticating signposts to Jesus' personhood. They center on Jesus' power and authority in Luke chapter 4, 31 to 41, and validate God's power in Jesus in Luke chapter 5, 17 to 8 to 39, as well as faith in Jesus, see in the prayer's motif, uh, Luke chapter 5, 25, 
Luke chapter 7, 16, but especially in Acts chapter 9, 35, Acts chapter 13, 12, Acts chapter 19, 17. So that's uh, the Marshall and Pickering, Pickering Encyclopedia concerning miracles. Sorry. And Oxford Companion to Philosophy, we read miracles, usually defined as a violation of a law of nature by a supernatural being. Questions have been raised about how to articulate a notion of law of nature which is not exceptionless by definition and how and whether such a definition applies to intermediatistic laws of nature. Any argument that a miraculous event has occurred faces the tough challenge of showing both that even in questions did occur that it was miraculous. A famous argument from Hugh's chapter of miracles shows how difficult a challenge this is to meet. To suppose that a miracle has occurred is to suppose that something has happened contrary to the entire weight of inductive evidence supporting the law of nature. In Hume's in words, no testimony is sufficient to establish a miracle unless the testimony be of such kind that its falsehood would be more miraculous and the fact which it endeavors to establish. Well, we, we said we wouldn't get into the philosophical, but um, I think that uh, the issue with you, um, it, it basically is just uh, ruling out the supernatural in a dogmatic way without you know we you, the uniformity of nature we we can't we, we, we don't know um, all the facts of nature so we, we don't know if if God can break into something or not if we're a skeptic uh, so if we don't know if God can break into history or not then we just have to be open to the historical data that's the only honest procedure to really it and to put so-called extraordinary uh, evidence as a burden of proof is just unfair. I think that we just have to be open to to any evidence that that presents itself, uh, especially in history, and um, it, it's about being open. Really, I, I think that's the basis. Uh, and then it's whether that evidence is consistent with your world view, I suppose. Those are my thoughts on that. Um, what I found interesting reading the uh, Baker Dictionary uh, Encyclopedia is how each of the collection of miracles in each of the Gospels was chosen for a purpose. So you had the more conflict in Mark, you had the miracles that expanded dialogue and teaching in Matthew and Luke emphasized the miracles emphasizing salvation and I think um, we often forget that each gospel does have its perspective on Jesus now the question would be well are the gospel writers biased well yeah every historian is biased and so each gospel was writing according to the perspective that he wanted to write uh, but that doesn't mean to say that we can't know history. Um, 
just going to uh, Yeah, so I think what we'll do um, <laughs> we've been looking at it all from one-sided perspective. So we'll we'll put a skeptic on now just for a minute. And uh, this is Richard Carrier. So uh, you listen to him for a minute while I get some. Ancient miracles from Greeks and um, our next speaker is one of the original people who came to Skepticon One, and he's been back ever since. Um, Richard Carrier, here we go. All right. Yes, excellent audio. We're going. Okay, uh, I'm going to talk about miracles and historical method, and I'm going to start by telling a story. This is a this is a, a true story actually supposedly um, allegedly uh, in uh, 172 A.D. Marcus Aurelius and his legions were fighting battles across the Danube in in the area of what would later become uh, Czechoslovakia and they got in a bit of a pickle uh, they actually ended up uh, surrounded in their stuck in their camp surrounded by the enemy out of water out of food uh, so they're dying of thirst it was in the middle of summer so they had no hope. Uh, and the, the enemy hordes were just about to besiege them, and so of course you know they were they were praying to all the gods and demons and devils they could. And suddenly the sky filled with dark clouds, and a torrential rain poured down, and the, the massive rain was so devastating that it was crushing and destroying the enemy. And while the Romans were holding up their shields and gathering the water and drinking it, and so they were their thirst was quenched by the gods from above. And if that wasn't enough, that wasn't cool enough. Balls of lightning thundered down from the sky and was annihilating the enemy and routing the enemy entirely. And so the, the Roman legions were victorious, and Rome was saved from uh, the Danube, Danubian horse. So uh, this was a great thing, and this was part of a all big campaign that he was fighting in the region. Uh, obviously, he returned victorious, and he erected, as generals often did, emperors often did in this period, he erected this gigantic column. And this column is basically a comic book. Uh, it tells the story of the campaign in a spiral setup of cells all the way up the whole uh, the whole column. And the column survives today. Uh, it suffered some damage from pollution and acid rain and stuff, but we have pictures from before it was corroded, and you can still see some of the uh, some of the details even now. And uh, the interesting thing is, uh, we actually have in this comic book this comic strip that goes spirals up this column. The, this miracle I just told you about is depicted there. We know about this miracle from some texts. Some, some authors did write about it, and I'm going to get to that in a moment. Uh, but I wanted to show you this, because this is uh, an, basically an artifact, a physical artifact, generated within two years of the event by an eyewitness who was there. Uh, and so you can't dispute it. This isn't cop a copy of a copy of a copy. This is a, a first-hand autograph uh, text. You know, it's a visual text of the event. And so here we have, uh, you can see, see if this works, yeah, so you got this little rain god that came and saved them. You can see his wings, so that, that's how you indicate that this is a god from heaven coming to save you. And the rain is pouring down, and you can see in this cell over here, the rain is pouring into the Roman shields, they're holding up the shields and drinking from them, and, it's, and the rain is coming down and just crushing and destroying the enemy over here. 
Uh, and further on, uh, up the thing a few cells beyond, uh, it also shows lightning bolts coming down and destroying the siege works of the enemy and so on. Uh, so this is pretty good evidence of this amazing miracle. And Christians wish they had that kind of evidence. So this is, this is the sequence of events. We had the miraculous battle in 172 AD. Uh, and then in 174, the column was completed. You know, it took a long time to make a really a beautiful, complicated piece of architecture like that. And the first stories, the first tales that, that, that survived for us to know of them, uh, begin with Christians, uh, the Christian apologist Apollinarius in 180 AD, and that's just eight years after the event. And then shortly after him, about 25 years after the event, Tertullian, a more infamous Christian apologist, uh, wrote his account of this miracle. Uh, the first time we hear the pagan version of it is 50 years after the account, so that's about the same distance between uh, the crucifixion and the Gospels, uh, from Cassius Dyer. So let's talk about these accounts. We're going to start with the Christian version. What did the Christians tell? Now, this is the first accounts that we have, the earliest accounts, within just years. Uh, this is their story. Uh, their, their story is that Marcus Aurelius had an entire legion of Christians, and that their prayers to Christ alone saved them. It was just because they prayed to Christ and that they were saved, and it saved the empire. And that Marcus Aurelius honored the Christian legion for this by officially renaming it the Thundering Legion. That's the Christian version. The pagan version, Marcus Aurelius had an Egyptian sorcerer with him named Harnufus. His spell, summoning the god Hermes, a messenger of Zeus, brought the miracle, and there's no mention of Christians. In fact, uh, the idea of a Christian legion under Marcus Aurelius is absurd on multiple levels. Uh, one of the things, in order to, at this time, Marcus Aurelius considered Christians to be disloyal to the empire because they wouldn't do the ancient equivalent of the Pledge of Allegiance, essentially. Uh, which was honor obeisance to the statue that represented the guardian spirit who protected the emperor. And that was your way of saying that I support the emperor at, by praying to his guardian spirit. But they wouldn't do that, and so he interpreted that as uh, being basically traitors to the empire. So, and also, if you were part of the legions, you had to give prayers and certain things uh, and certain ritual called paid to Jupiter Optimus Maximus, whom I'll introduce you to in a moment. Uh, and these are things that Christians couldn't do. So you couldn't have, Marcus Aurelius would never have Christians and legions, and the idea of an entire legion full of them is absurd on multiple levels. So the story, the, the Christian story is a little bogus. The pagan story sounds weirder then. So which one is true? Like, who, where is the truth in all of this? Uh, first of all, you might wonder, what, what is an Egyptian sorcerer doing summoning Hermes, the Greek god? Uh, so a little brief lesson in how pagans understood their world. Uh, they didn't think that, that Hermes was different from Thoth. They, they, the idea was that Everybody was worshiping the same gods, just under different names. And so you spoke a different language, you used a different word for your god. And many of the gods had met multiple names. So the, the, the pagans had no trouble with the idea of thinking that the Greek god Hermes was really just the, the Egyptian god Thoth, and the Egyptians thought the same thing back, back and forth. Just in the same way that the Roman god Mercury was just considered to be the Roman version of, of Hermes, they all thought it was the same god. You're just using different rituals and, and using different names for them. Uh, and again, Hermes is the messenger of Zeus, uh, but Zeus was equated to the Egyptian god of Ra, and the Roman version was Jupiter Optimus Maximus, Jupiter best and greatest. And that was the, the chief god of the Roman Empire and of the Roman legions. Now the interesting thing is, uh, right within the period of this war, and right in the area, in the area of what would later become Czechoslovakia, we recovered a temple that was dedicated by the emperor, to Jupiter Optimus Maximus Cassius, which is the name of the sort of local deity there. But the iconography shows that this is a representation of uh, Jupiter or Zeus as the Thunderbolter. This is the Zeus Thunderbolter. Jupiter Optimus Maximus, the thrower of thunderbolts. Now it's kind of interesting that we have the emperor dedicating a temple to uh, Zeus Thunderbolter right at the exact time that we hear that there was a, a miracle in which thunderbolts saved the, the legions. So we have some physical evidence supporting and corroborating that part of the story. We also have, uh, interestingly enough, in the same region, from the same time, a inscription dedicated to the goddess Isis, uh, two, two people, Harnufus, the sacred scribe from Egypt, and Terentius Priscus, uh, probably a Roman legionnaire, who dedicated it to the appearing goddess, the goddess who appears and manifests herself, and that's an that's epithet of the goddess Isis. So here we have a Harnufus, an Egyptian sorcerer, as he's identified as a sacred scribe, uh, with the legions in that time, in that place, and that, you know, what are the odds of that? So this does look like we actually had a Harnufus with the legions. Uh, so the pagan story is starting to look a little better. Now, another thing that happened, uh, right after the war, as soon as he got back, 
uh, as soon as he returned from these campaigns, he uh, instituted, uh, Marcus Aurelius instituted coins. He started coining some uh, special currency, honoring something. Uh, we can, I can guess and infer what. Uh, but the legend on the coin was Religio Augusti, which means the religion of the emperor. And it depicts on one side the bust of Marcus Aurelius, and on this side that I'm showing a, a drawing of Hermes standing in an Egyptian temple. So what are the odds that the emperor would suddenly start striking coins honoring Hermes in an Egyptian temple as his religion uh, for? Not only did he do it immediately after returning, but the coin issue stopped as soon as the column was dedicated. So it was issued from the December of 172 AD until 174. So here we have uh, more physical evidence corroborating the pagan account. Now, let's, stop, let's top that off with one more interesting thing. You know how the Christians said that he renamed the legion, the Thundering Legion, because of this great miracle that they did? Well, it turns out, you know, funny thing, funny story, um, over 100 years earlier, we know that this legion was already called the Thundering Legion. Uh, and this is another inscription from Egypt, incidentally, from Thebes, Egypt. Uh, another inscription by some, uh, some officers and NCOs of... Uh, the 12th legion that was the legion responsible, and it says right there, the 12th legion called Fulminati, Fulminati, the thundering legion, and they date it. The inscription was made in the 11th year of Nero, which is 64 AD. So we know this legion had been called the thundering legion for ages and ages before this miracle occurred. Uh, so strike one there for the Christian account. So every aspect of the Christian story is refuted by the evidence. Every aspect of the pagan version is confirmed in the evidence. Yet the Christian legend arose within just a few years, a few years, not decades, a few years, and it prevailed. In the Western Middle Ages, the, the, um, the pagan version was forgotten entirely. The only version that was known in the Western European area was the Christian version. It completely eclipsed and won out. Uh, and the only reason we know about the pagan version of this is because one dude in the Eastern Byzantine Empire preserved one pagan historian who just happened to mention it. Uh, and just that one text. And so we only find that, found that out when those texts started creeping west uh, after the Renaissance. So, uh, so that, that's an interesting piece of facts there that you can use to compare uh, with the way Christians talk about things. Now, what, what are the... What... <laughs> what can we take away from this? Well, that. Christians were big-ass liars. Yeah. Um, we'll see some more examples of that before we're done today. I'm going to talk about Herodotus. Uh, let's go back. This is before the Roman Empire. This is back in classical Greece. Herodotus was a well-known uh, historian of the time. He became one of the most read uh, historian class texts in ancient schools later on. He's born in 485 BC. He wrote around 430 BC, give or take five years, about the Persian War, which occurred in 479 and 480 BC. So roughly 50 years. He's writing 50 years uh, after the events he's recording. So it's roughly, again, the same time between the Gospels and the events the Gospels claim to describe. What does he tell us about? Well, there's certain amazing things happened during the Persian War. Uh, one thing was this really incredible defense of the Temple of Delphi, which is considered the center of the universe and one of the holiest sites. It's kind of the Greek equivalent of the Jerusalem Temple, the closest thing they had to. Uh, and this is Delphi. It's a picture of the ruins of Delphi today, and so what happened at Delphi is the Persians were going to assault and capture Delphi, the holiest city of, of the Greeks. You know, this is, this is the most biggest embarrassing thing that could happen. Uh, but they couldn't take it, because you know why? Because Delphi, the gods defended Delphi. There's literally the armor and armaments that were uh, dedicated to the temple got up of themselves and walked out and fought the Persians. And uh, there was also um, lightning bolts came down and struck them, and, cl and cliffs cliffs miraculously started collapsing and crushing the troops as they tried to get up. And so Delphi was preserved. And so I want you to picture, like, look here, uh, try to picture it. Animated armaments fighting. You know, this would be an awesome movie, by the way. But uh, I just want to go back to uh, Richie Carrier there. Um, first of all, what strikes me, I've always, I've loved, every time uh, Richie Carrier makes a quotation uh, on an ancient document, when I've checked it out, he's always wrong. Uh, just to note that, whenever he, he quotes any documents, I found him not notoriously to be inaccurate in his quotations. Uh, so I would check anything that he said out before you actually take it on board. Uh, he often ch uh, quotes things out of context. Uh, he said that Christians are big ass liars and about how. Um, uh, the whole historical situation that he was describing. Um, the thing that strike, strikes me there 
is um, that he says that the Christians would have twisted the whole thing but here's the point they were in the ancient text they were in the ancient text and so therefore um, is is misapplying uh, information there saying that there was a particular on the historical event from the Christian perspective and that's all I have to say there and uh, I think that I, I kind of find that Richard Carrier has a, an agenda where he's so desiring to deconstruct Christianity and critique Christianity that he doesn't actually engage with any scholars who are different and he tries to um, just paint his own perspective without actually engaging with people who, who, who disagree with him. Um, the whole thing that struck me though with the historical event that he described is there was no eyewitness accounts. Uh, I know he'd probably go on to Herodotus and, and talk about that but here in Luke chapter 1 we so we read these most honourable Theophilus many people have written accounts about the events that took place among us they used as their source material the reports circulating among us from the early disciples and other eyewitnesses of what God has done in fulfilment of his promises having carefully investigated all these accounts from the beginning I have decided to write a careful summary for you to reassure you of the truth of all you were taught so Luke saying that he is basing his accounts on eyewitness material um, so I'm just uh, trying to this is one of the great scholars of the New Testament Professor Engel in recent years some authors have jested that the four New Testament Gospels were only uh, popular or they only gained their authority many centuries after Christ and for political reasons. Is there any evidence for that? Not at all. This is all invention. It isn't true. The Gospels were, uh, became important for Christianity already shortly after the time they have been written in the second century. In the first who knows all and knows the fourth gospel altogether is Irenaeus about 180, but he takes over this uh, tradition from Asia Minor from an earlier time. We have quite a lot of gospel testimonies from the beginning of the second century, and especially since Justin in the midst the Apologet, where is uh, where knows them all, and the same is true with Irenaeus and his, um, the other writers of his time, like Tertullian and like Clement of Alexandria and uh, Theophilus of Antioch. Uh, and, of and I think all over the Roman Empire, in, at the end of the second century, the Gospels were well known to Christian communities. And there was no political reason at that time, uh, up to 311, the uh, Edict of Tolerance by Emperor Galerius, uh, the, the, Christian, the, the Christian communities were uh, persecuted sometimes and uh, were in, uh, uh, they had not under Roman law, they were free to decide what they want to have read in service and what, what not. Uh, the most important, the most important uh, source for the early reading of the Gospels, especially the Gospels in uh, the Christian servants, in the Christian service is about 150 by Justin, where he is writing that the Christians are coming together uh, for uh, the service, for a meeting, and uh, where the prayers were, were told, and then what were read first the Gospels or the scriptures of the prophets and then came all again and there was a, then there was a sermon 
an exegesis of the text which was read, and then against prayers, and then came the Eucharist. And the, the text which is written for the Roman Emperor uh, Antoninus Pius to show that the Christians are no criminals uh, shows that this tradition of the reading of the Gospels, Justin speaks of uh, rem memories of the Apostles, upon Neumata, the Don Apostolon, where this is uh, what was in use already since long time, in my opinion, since the end of the first century, as a in the, church, in the communities here in Rome, but the same in Asia Minor and probably also in Syria and Alexandria. So the idea that there were perhaps 50 different Gospels and, and our four Gospels of the New Testament were just lucky to win the day, that's nonsense. That's what you're saying, is it? There, there were, of course, later Gospels, apocryphal Gospels, quite a lot, and many have found. But the four Gospels we have are the earliest witnesses we possess and there are not earlier Gospels uh, we, can, we, we have. We have all the sources. Already Luke is um, uh, mentioning sources he used and uh, sources from eyewitnesses. But we have no older and better Gospels than the, the four we have, which are already in use in, uh, in Justin in the midst of the second century and quite clearly in Uranus. Uh, already Justin writes in his dialogue. Um, against this trifo, that the apostles, the, that the memories, that the, that the memories of the apostles are written by the apostles themselves, or by followers of the gospels, uh, or by followers of the um, uh, apostles, and this shows already the apostles are for, uh, are for uh, Justin, uh, John, uh, Matthew and John, and the followers are Mark and Luke. This leads to the next question I wanted to ask you. Um, some have said that the Gospels were originally anonymous and that the names Matthew, Mark, Luke and John were added to lend them weight. This is quite improbable. First, the Gospels were written all for the open reading in the Christian service, in the worship, and uh, the, therefore the people who are hearing, the most are uh, and literally they couldn't uh, read, and therefore the, the, the text was read aloud just now in our services. The people must know what text is read. The same is true with the Old Testament text. They all have uh, the Old Testament books, all, all his titles. Either with the uh, author, like in the book of the prophets, or, uh, or Moses was thought to be the author of the first books, of the first five books of the Bible. Or a book of uh, contents, maybe the, the Psalms, or uh, the wisdom of Solomon, like that. And so, from the beginning, it was necessary because for the Jews and the service that the gospel had titles. This is a one first important reading, and we know from Justin that the people knew what, uh, the, what who the authors of the gospels are. And the second uh, point is that if the Gospels were written anonymous, uh, then uh, they, later they had put, put the title upon it. Uh, the question is, who has invented this title? There was no uniformity at that time in the Church, uh, and if there were anonymous, anonymous Gospels in the different communities, there should have been different titles, but the title Titles are uh, uh, all, all the same from, uh, I think, at the end of the second century, they are uh, identical with Irenaeus and Lyon and with Clement in Alexandria and with Theophil uh, and uh, Serapion in Antioch and, of course, in Rome and with Tertullian in, uh, in uh, Carthage in Africa. Well, I think the titles were identical. Can I ask why were these four Gospels so important to the first Christians? Because they were the main, the unique source for the deeds and the words of Jesus and his passion. Because they brought Jesus to the first Christians. I think and they con were containing the witness of the, the witnesses 
of the IV, uh, the, uh, the, rem the memories, they, are, they contain the memories of the first witnesses, the Peter and other apostles. And also not important not to forget uh, some women. Professor Hengel, in recent years, some authors have suggested that the four New Testament Gospels were only uh, popular or they only... standard scholarly view of how the traditions about Jesus reach the evangelists when they were writing their gospels is the view that formed criticism proposed early in the 20th century. And the view is that the eyewitnesses who heard Jesus speak, who saw the events of his life, presumably started the traditions off. But then there began a whole process of these traditions passing through the oral traditions of the of the early early Christian communities until eventually uh, they were tapped by the uh, evangelists. Um, and during that process, of course, anything could happen. And there have been different ways of reading it. Some people managed to read it in a fairly conservative way, as though the tradition preserved the traditions pretty well. Um, but the foreign critics um, and the real disciples of the foreign critics tend not to think that because they stress that the communities and the oral tradition was not really interested in history. So they have no real motive for preserving the traditions about Jesus accurately. Their motives are much more to adapt and add to and kind of create freely uh, traditions about Jesus um, and add them to the traditions. And, and that's why on the form critical view you need, if you are going to say something about the historical Jesus, you need criteria to distinguish authentic material gospels from inauthentic material, um, and that's the way a whole lot of gospel scholarship has gone. It's been very widely agreed now, I think, that the gospels were biographies in the sense of ancient biography. Um, this has been debated, but that's becoming the prevailing view, I think. Um, not in the sense of modern biographies, of course. We have to rule out all kinds of things that modern biographers do. Um, the kinds of things an ancient biographer did uh, are what are appropriate to the gospels. But further than that, I think we have to see them as contemporary biographies, in the sense they were written while there were still eyewitnesses around. Um, and this is extremely important, because the way the ancients thought about history, writing of history, is that you could only write good history um, within living memory of the events. Um, and they distinguished real history in that sense. If real history has to be contemporary history, um, and it's because they didn't have uh, all the kinds of archives and all the kinds of uh, sources and, and, and so forth uh, that modern historians had. What mattered for them is that they themselves either had been a participant in the events themselves, and that of course was the best thing of all, or alternatively they'd, they'd actually been able to interview uh, eyewitnesses of the events. So the Gospels, I think, fit within that category um, that people would expect to be good history. They would expect it to be reliant on eyewitnesses. And they would, I think, be alert to indications in the Gospels of what the eyewitness sources of those Gospels were. The form critics um, regarded the Gospels as folk literature. Um, and this is why they were insistent on a long process of oral tradition. They were thinking of the kinds of traditional literature that's passed down orally in societies over the nations. Um, and that accounts for a lot of the way they thought about the Gospels. And it's partly why they denied that the Gospels are history or biography, they're folk literature. Um, but I think most scholars now think that was a mistake. Um, and if you compare the Gospels with uh, the literature of their time, uh, they turn out to resemble biographies uh, best of all. Um, so I think we have to rethink that whole idea of what kind of thing the Gospels are. And if people would have expected them to be historical, 
if, if that's the kind of literary genre they would have identified um, when they first read or heard the Gospels, then I think we've got to apply uh, the kind of expectations uh, that ancient readers and hearers of historiographical literature uh, would have expected. We have these fragments of Papias's lost work. Sad. So there we are. We finished uh, our evening. What what do we conclude about the four Gospels and and the miracles? Um, I think what's unique with the Gospels is that we have these four documents that certify that Jesus did these miracles, and I think that separates it from these ancient stories because of this un these unique four documents and that's the big difference between what Richard Carrier was saying about the miracles of um, of, of uh, the Roman world and what he would go into when he talks about Herodotus um, even though Herodotus uh, said that he'd interviewed eyewitness accounts, um, in terms of a historical document, the Gospels, uh, there are more copies and they come earlier in, in their copy and uh, are based on a multiplicity of eyewitness accounts because the uh, four Gospels uh, give four different perspectives on these miracles. So I think that's why they stand out differently than other ancient uh, miracles. Uh, we looked at Kina on miracles and his work. We listened to an atheist, Richard Kaya, and we listened to Martin Engel and Richard Balkum, which talk about the gospel, um, the gospels, and the nature of the gospels. Why the gospels are early historical documents. Um, and uh, with that, it's time to go to sleep now. And thank you for coming. And may God bless you. Take care.